Eton, the jewel of the South Midlands, the town who gave us such great men as George Eliot and Larry Grayson, the throbbing heart of this teeming metropolis, the pearl of the CV13 postcode, down by the roundabout and up the one-way system, is Nuneaton Town Hall, where we can find none other than Nuneaton's Mr. Entertainment. Hello ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, I'm Barry Tadcaster and this is my friend Ken Jevons who is an Orang Pendek. Hello, my name is Ken Jevons and I am an Orang Pendek. Unlike the other Orang Pendeks, I do not come from the Indonesian island of Sumatra. I come from the London borough of Lewisham where I am employed by Lewisham Town Council as an ombudsman. It's that time of the week. It's on the track extra. What are we doing, Ken? This week we are meeting a man who chases whelks up trees for the RAF. And so the great lockdown continues. Even Woolsbury, which at the best of times is a small village in the middle of nowhere, is almost deserted. But the work of the CFZ continues, even though, as Prince Afari would have put it, it's continuing under heavy manners. After some weeks of unsuccessfully trying to find a screen recorder that will work on my iPad, and by the way, if anybody does know how I can record Facebook Messenger conversations on my iPad, please let me know. I've bought a rather nifty piece of software, which means I can do it very easily and conveniently on my PC. So what was the first thing I did? I called Charlotte. Hello Charlotte, are you enjoying your lunch? Yes. Oh, it's nice to talk to you again. I've missed you. How long... How are you getting on with this lockdown thing? All right. It doesn't really change from my, like, my daily life because I'm mostly at my desk all day and I don't really leave the house that often. So it's not that different, but... It's just I'm talking to less people now. So it's it's just kind of like... Making a difference, but not a big one. But I feel like it's just going to like pile up over time. Oh well, you just have to talk to me a bit more. Yeah. Okay, take a mouthful of your meatballs. So this has to be really civilized. I'm drinking coffee. You're eating meatballs. I just ate the last meatball. I think this is just vegetables now. So, have you been going out at all for your daily exercises? I've gone out for a few walks, not like one every day. Have you seen any interesting wildlife? I saw some plants. Me and Mum went on a walk on into the Vale a couple of weeks back and she gave me basically like a botany lesson, which was interesting. For the record, um, Michelle's mother is a trainee herbalist and knows far more about leaves and things than anybody else I know. Just in mm. case you wondered why she was g giving Charlotte a botany lesson. Now, I only ask because um, the, apparently all around the world, as people are staying in, and keeping out of the environment, the environment is supposedly getting um, cleaner and nicer. And I was wondering mm. if that was happening in Heartland. But then again, Heartland's pretty clean and nice anyway. Yeah, I mean, one thing we notice is that the sky is a lot bluer. But I haven't seen more wildlife or anything. But it's pretty quiet over here anyway, unless it's like Carnival weekend. Have you seen that footage of that town in Wales where all the wild goats have invaded the... Um, yeah. Cause I, I, yeah, I, I, 
I think that's brilliant because you yeah. know um, since YouTube changed um, the uh, its terms of service, every time you upload a video now, you have to they ask you the question: Are there any kids in this video? Mm. And I'm going to be able to say yes. There's lots of kids. That's a kid. 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 And nobody's going to laugh because nobody ever laughs at my pathetic attempts at humour. Mm. Well, Charlotte, we've got a fact-filled episode this time. We have got you and me talking about the butterfly pictures that Gwyn managed to get us permissions for, which are actually very interesting because they do show the changing face of British wildlife even before the coronavirus lockdown. And we've got Richard, Richard Muirhead, talking about the water leaper, which is a very strange aquatic creature that's known from folklore. And he, although it's known from Welsh folklore, he's come up with a example of it from East Anglia. And you've got me and Richard Freeman ranting on about books. So I think when it's finally, ed finally edited, I think you're going to enjoy it. Half a century ago this summer, about six months before my family left Hong Kong for good, I met a little boy called Richard Muirhead. I was eleven and he was about six. And guess what? Half a century later, we're still friends. Apart from a few people to whom I'm related, Richard is the person I've known longest in the world. He's a most peculiar fellow, he writes poetry, he's obsessed with a band called Devo and has been known to wear a funny Devo hat that I bought him. And if that weren't special enough, he's also one of the two best researchers I have ever met. And lucky for us all, his speciality is cryptozoology. I've been wanting to have him on the show for years. And now, in the midst of the great lockdown, Richard and I, experimenting with some new software I've just bought, are bringing you the first episode of Muirhead's Mysteries. Well, the water leaper is a term given to a cryptid first popularised by Carl Schucker. Uh, on, in uh, one of his books or blogs about five, ten years ago. It looks like a cross between a ray, a snake, and a toad. I also came across what I call my water leaper story, which I published, uh, published in this magazine, Flying Snake, November 2012. And I, I drew my own interpretation of it which I will attempt to find. Here we are. I see. Tail of a snake, yeah. elongated, bat like wings, four legs, two of them are hit. This is like a view from above. Head like a toad. Here are its back legs. Its front legs will be underneath these bat like wings or protuberances. Can I read the description of it from the Bodleian Library's? online database. Of course you can. The following letter from Thomas Flatman dated September 25th, 1662 to his brother is in the Bodleian Library, Oxford. I found it in the early modern letters online database, which I thoroughly recommend. The illustration on the following page is by myself, which I just showed you. The transcript below is taken from the style in the Bodleian Library sent to me just as in the original. Dear brother, I have just leisure enough to answer that part of yours which concerns the news of the serpent amongst us. I have not seen it myself, but can name you twenty that have all ag agreeing punctually in their relation and description of the same. It is above a yard and a half long and head like a toad, but a very large yellowish ring about the neck, 
two wings as broad as a man's hand, like a bat's, four yellow short legs like a duck, as big as a lusty man's thigh. This has got to be the only cryptozoological um, TV show, online TV show, web TV show, whatever you want to call it, that talks about a lusty man's thigh. <laughs> Head and back all covered with thick scales, which shine in the sun, reflect all manner of colours. He was seen eating a water hen. It's most often seen before sunrise in the morning, at about noon when the sun shines bright and hot. Here is one affirms that he surprised the serpent one morning, and being in a place where he could not retreat, he rises and sprung at the man, but missed him. So, there we have it. It reminded me of a grass snake, the coloration. But grass snakes don't have wings by the head like bats. Have there been any, Unless it was shedding its skin. Have there been any suggestions as to what this creature might be? Well, Carl should got included in his Sugar Nature blog, and it, he brought it into the category of water leaper. Well, I think it might be a type of ray, fresh water ray, as you mentioned earlier to me there in South America, but I've never heard of a fresh water ray in the British Isles. One thing that is interesting, um, although there are no fresh water rays in British waters, there is at least one species of flatfish which can come in, the flounder comes into fresh water quite right. often. And is there any of these flatfish in, in South East England? Yes, I think it's quite likely. But, uh, well, that's, maybe that's what it was then. Well, I don't know, because there's no... Because presumably the water leaper leaps out of the water. This one that I described um, did leap at a man. It did leap. Well, I don't think a flounder has been known to leap out of the water, and I wouldn't have thought a flounder would be ferocious enough to eat a water hen. And I'm swallowing. Which, again, a flatfish doesn't. Yes. Did you say Carl Schuker discovered, um, Carl Schuker wrote about them in Wales? The, the, the water leaper is Welsh. Yes, in Wales, yeah. But this one here was in Suffolk, I think. Golly. Well, Richard, it's a really, really interesting but, um, interesting story. What do you think it is? I think it was a ray, some sort of a ray. Have you come across any more accounts of it? Well, not like this one, no. I've always liked the way that you come up with these stories. I've, ne I never, he I've never heard of... Um, 80% of the stuff that you come up with. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> okay, Richard, tell us I a don't bit. know either. We recently put out the collect a collected volume of the first, uh, the first five, I think it was, um, issues of your magazine, Flying Snake. Tell us a bit about it. Flying Snake was, was something I launched in 2011 after much uh, trying to convince myself I wouldn't be able to do it, master the software and all that. It originally intended to be covering cryptozoology, folklore and Fortiana. This is a typical edition, although it's, it is quite a few years ago. I'll just read you the in this issue um, in this issue section, Zanzibar fish displays Quran, 17th century British toad monsters, which is where the Suffolk creature we're just talking about comes in, Mary Toft rabbit birth case, that's a story about Mary Toft giving birth to rabbits, Scottish wonder boy, giant crocodile ballad, Cats' eyes as clocks. Chinese coins in strange places. That would come under Fortiana. Japanese snake with two legs. And more. So it's a 
potpourri of mainly crypto, what I call archive, old school. It seems the further back you go, the more interesting things are, really, I think. And this collected edition of Flying Snake, together with Richard's other book, Muirhead's Mysteries, can be bought at the link in the description. Why are you wearing headphones? Well, I've managed to blow up the studio amp and I won't get another one till next week. That sucks. Yeah, it's also very stupid of me. It was my fault. I was being idiotic. But I do have some good news for you. What is it? Gwyn has to come up trumps. You know, we took her on. She volunteered to do some stuff for us. Yeah. And we took her on to do um, picture research for us. Yeah. Well, I found two pictures last week that I wanted to use, and she's got permissions to use them both. Cool. So let me tell you about them. I know it's been the end of a long, cold, wet and nasty winter, but would you believe that we've got at least two really interesting migrant insects in this country at the moment? Why are they? Well, this butterfly is called uh, a Camberwell Beauty. Well, everywhere else in the world it's known as a morning cloak because they say that because it's mostly dark in colour and it's got a little bit of um, brightly coloured um, wings on the outside, on the outside that it's supposed to be a young woman at a funeral who's wearing a long dark cloak because she's in mourning, but you can still see a little bit of the pretty clothes she's wearing underneath, around the edges. But in Britain it's known as the Camberwell Beauty. Do you know why? No. Because the first one, the type of specimen, was caught in what is now the London borough of Camberwell. Which, and it was always known as one of Britain's rarest butterflies, and it's particularly rare because it doesn't come from here. It's not the weirdest rare butterfly in Britain, I'll get onto that in a minute, but it's really rare because it actually comes from northern Scandinavia, mostly Finland. And it usually comes to Britain hibernating, in logs that have been cut down from fir trees in Finland. Hmm. And this one was photographed last week. It's incredibly rare. And it's really nice that one of the first butterflies of the year is something quite so rare. Hmm. But what about this? Do you know what that is? No. It's a hummingbird hawk moth. And they, again, are... They're not as rare as Camberwell Beauties, but they are a rare, they are a migrant from southern Europe, and they usually come up here in the early summer. And various species of hummingbird hawk moth are found all along the um, subtropics, and they do regularly come up to Britain. But this one, being photographed at a RAF base in Britain in the middle of February obviously it hasn't hibernated, obviously it hasn't migrated. Mm. It's very unusual for hummingbird hawk moths because not only is it hibernated but it's still alive at the end of the hibernation. Yeah. And what this tells us about the future of butterflies and moths in Britain I don't know. But as the weather is undoubtedly changing mm. and the weather patterns are completely different than they were when I was a boy, the natural history of Britain, particularly the natural history of things that can fly, which is birds and butterflies and moths mostly, is going to change massively. And I think that this is quite an interesting um, example of what we could be getting in the future. It always amazes me how people 
who claim to be researchers, particularly cryptozoological researchers, can say that they don't have a library, they don't have a collection of books on the subject. Because to me, the most important tool in a researcher's arsenal is his library. And so Richard and I are going to go through, one at a time, and almost at random, books taken from the CFZ library, so we can recommend or otherwise. So guys, here we are back with our look at cryptozoological books that should or shouldn't be in your library. And the next one we have is this, which is Monster Hunt, The Guide to Cryptozoology by something called Rory Storm. Now, I'm pretty sure that name is not true. Why? Because Rory Storm was a rock and roll singer from the early 1960s and late 1950s, and his band was the first professional engagement for a bloke called Ringo Starr. And I've always thought Rory Storm is a very unlikely name. I think his real name is Bobby Caldwell or something. And the idea that two people can be called Rory Storm, one a rock and roller and the other author of a book about cryptozoology, is a little bit iffy. But Richard, I remember you read this book, you reviewed this book. What do you think of it? Um, I think it is utterly, egregiously bad. Uh, it's full of inaccuracies, bad illustrations that look nothing like the descriptions of the creatures uh, that they're supposed to represent. Uh, for example, uh, on the um, Ogopogo section, they give the length of Ogopogo as 15 to 20 feet. Even a cursory examination of Ogopogo sightings will tell you that the creature is more like 30 to 80 feet long, much bigger than uh, than what it says in this book. It's written with a total lack of knowledge. It's sort of been slapped together. It's like somebody somewhere at a publisher's came up with this idea, got any generic writer to do it, and they banged it out in a couple of weeks with the minimum amount of research and uh, really bad illustrations that look nothing like the creatures. One of the things that irritates me is the way that it has been presented to make it look cursorily as if it was an ancient Victorian tome on the subject, but they've not even done it very well. It's just tacky. And I agree with you totally, Richard, about the illustrations. Here we have the Tatsal Worm. Does that, Richard, look anything like a Tatsal Worm? No. Why does it not look like a Tatsal Worm? Richard? Well, it's, it's got too many legs for a start, and it's got that weird crest running down its back that the Tatsal Worm is never described as having. Basically, can you think of anything good you can say about this book? No. It's a complete waste of money. Um, I'm just very glad I didn't pay for it. Because, like you said, waste of money. Yeah, we got it as a review copy. And I uh, told it like it was. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that On The Track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at, about and for people from the Centre for Forty and Zoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought that people from the Centre for Fortune and Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago I decided that I was going to rebrand on the track. I thought we'd do a monthly episode in about half an hour 
and then in between each episode we do what I call On The Track Extra, which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old weird weekend. And have a look at these two examples, which I chose almost at random because I thought that you might enjoy them. 